In this video, I'm going to show you how to connect your .NET application with Sentry. It's a software monitoring tool that's packed with many useful features, such as support for distributed tracing, performance monitoring, error tracking, and alerts. I'm going to show you how to set up and configure the Sentry SDK inside of an ASP.NET Core application, and then we're going to use it to solve some interesting problems inside of our microservices architecture. A huge thank you to Sentry for sponsoring this video, and if you want to follow along with me during this demo, I suggest that you go ahead and click the link that's going to be in the pinned comment below, where you're going to get free access to Sentry, and you can also grab the source code and code along with me as we go through the examples. I want to start off by introducing a couple of problems that naturally occur when you're working with a microservices architecture. Let's call these the microservices observability problems. And the first one is having visibility into the performance of your microservices system. It's usually fairly simple to figure out where the performance bottlenecks are inside of a single microservice, but when they need to interact with each other, it becomes increasingly more difficult to pinpoint where the actual performance problem is. Sentry can be an excellent solution here with support for distributed tracing, which also contains timing information, allowing us to figure out where the slowly performing services are, and you can also hook into the profiling support that Sentry has, which has the ability to pinpoint problems at the source code level. Another issue that we're going to run into is error tracking in a distributed system. Microservices are typically asynchronous and it's not uncommon for an error that occurs inside of one system to propagate into another system leading to a chain of failures and this type of problem can be difficult to track, however you'll see how Sentry simplifies this. Lastly, there's the so-called black box problem of inter-service communication. The problem here is you can't really be certain what's causing the failure. Is it a database that's crashed in the other microservice that we are calling or is this microservice reaching out to another service that we aren't aware of, which is currently down, and we aren't able to reach it. This type of problem is surprisingly difficult to pinpoint with just plain old logging, but when we introduce distributed tracing into our system, we suddenly gain a lot more visibility. I already mentioned OpenTelemetry a couple of times, and it's an open source standard that gives you a simple way to generate application telemetry. This includes logs, traces, and metrics, and export them in a standardized format into solutions that can do something with this data and Sentry is one of those solutions. So I want to leverage Sentry support for open telemetry and integrate that with a couple of instrumentation libraries that we're going to add inside of our .NET application. The end result is going to be very useful and you can see an example of that right here which is what a distributed trace looks like inside of Sentry's trace explorer which we are going to explore in depth once we are able to integrate Sentry into our application. Now speaking of the application, what does our application look like? Here's a very simple high-level diagram representing our microservices system where we have three distinct components or services. We have the order service, which is the main microservice in our system that interacts with the shipping service and the product service, which are responsible for their business capabilities. We're going to see how Sentry will help us figure out some problems that we have inside of our current implementation, and then we're going to see how we can solve these problems and validate these solutions. Now let's jump into the code and see what our application looks like. This is our eShop microservices application, and I'm going to walk you through the main flows that we're going to be looking at as part of this video. So I'll start from the order service, and inside of it there are the respective endpoints, and the main endpoint that kicks off the entire flow is the post endpoint with the route orders. It accepts a create order DTO, so as you can figure, this is actually used to create an order inside of our system. Now what's actually happening inside is a bit more complex, so we're going to accept a request coming from our client application, and we're first going to validate the order items that are passed in on this request. And to do this, we're going to reach out to the product service, which is going to send an API request over the network to the product's API microservice. This is going to give us back the product DTO, which contains some information that we can use to validate if we can place this order. And if all of these validations succeed, we can go ahead and create the respective order items, calculate the order total, and finally create the order and persist it inside of our system. Now, we also want to notify downstream services, so we are going to publish an order created integration event. And there is a consumer for this event inside of the shipping microservice, so let's take a look at that. Inside of the shipping module, there is the order created consumer, which is going to handle this integration event and create a shipment record and persist it inside of the database of the shipping service. But this is only part of the work. There is also a background job that is continuously scanning for pending shipments, 
and when it finds one that's not yet been shipped, and we know that this is the case when the shipment status is equal to pending, then we're going to pick up the shipment and just publish a shipment record scheduled event. So we're using the background service to kick off the work, but not actually execute the expensive operation. We want more control by publishing a message to a queue and then consuming that from the service. The main logic happens in the shipment record scheduled consumer where we are going to find the shipment record and we're going to attempt to reserve the order stock in the order service. Now all of this is happening in succession pretty quickly and most of the time we expect it to succeed, but in some case it may fail. How we actually handle the failure case is a business concern and we have a few options. We could just set the shipment status to fail, we could notify some stakeholders that this occurred, or we could also retry reserving the order stock hoping that this time it's going to be successful. Nonetheless, this completes the flow that we are going to observe and currently there are a couple of issues here. The first one is that the the order creation process is fairly slow. Now we don't yet know this for certain, this is where Sentry is going to help us, and the second problem is that reserving the order stock sometimes fails. So we're going to see if Sentry can help us figure out why this is the case, but in order to get started, we first have to set up Sentry inside of our applications. So I'm going to close all of this down, and let's start from the orders API. I'll open up the program file, and scroll down here, where I have my open telemetry setup. So I already have some instrumentation in place for my service, such as HTTP client instrumentation, ASP.NET Core instrumentation, EF Core instrumentation, MPG SQL because I'm using Postgres, and I'm also adding a source for my mass transit listener. Now, in order to integrate Sentry, I need to install two additional NuGet packages. So let me go ahead and browse through my NuGet packages and I'm going to search for Sentry. The first NuGet package I want to install is Sentry ASP.NET Core. So let me go ahead and add the latest version and I'm also going to look for Sentry OpenTelemetry, here it is, and let me go ahead and install the latest version as well. So with these two libraries installed, I now have what I need to configure Sentry inside of my application. So I'm going to say builder web host, and I'll say use Sentry. This is a new extension method that we have, and it also exposes an overload that allows me to configure the Sentry ASP.NET Core options. So let's go ahead and access that. And here we can configure a bunch of configuration values. The first one that you would want to set is the data source name. And this is how Sentry knows where to send the telemetry data so that you can observe it inside of your Sentry tenant. I'm going to show you how to get this value in just a moment, but I first want to configure a few more options. I'll set the send default PII property to true. I'm also going to set the sample rate to 1.0, which means I want to capture as much telemetry data as possible. And the last missing piece of the puzzle is you have to call use open telemetry when configuring the Sentry ASP.NET Core options. And this is what is going to tell Sentry to use open telemetry for distributed tracing. Now we also have to do one more thing, and that is to configure Sentry when configuring tracing. So I'm just going to add a call to add Sentry. It's another extension method that we got. And this is all the code I needed to change in order to integrate Sentry into my application. Now, what about the data source name value? Well, let's jump into the Sentry dashboard. And here I'm going to navigate to my Sentry project. Now, what you have to do to get to this point is create a Sentry account. You can do that by going to Sentry.io and then go ahead and create a project. So this is my project for my ASP.NET Core application and this is where I'm going to export my telemetry data. Now I'm going to go into the settings for my project, and from the settings you're going to navigate to client keys. And here is your data source name value, which you are going to copy and add as a configuration value inside your application. Now let's go back to our code, and instead of hard coding this value, let's actually be smart about it. So I'm going to say builder, configuration, and I want to get the Sentry DSN value, and we are going to provide this using user secrets so that we don't accidentally commit it into source control. So let me right click my project, and then I'm going to say manage user secrets, and here I'm going to say Sentry DSN, and I'm going to paste in the value that I copied for my Sentry project. So now I'm going to repeat this 
in the other two services that I have. Another option that's important to configure when setting up the Sentry SDK is the traces sample rate, which as you might assume configures how much of the application's traces we are going to capture and export into Sentry. And now that I have Sentry properly configured in all of my microservices, I can go ahead and run the application. So let's go ahead and start it. If I open up Docker Desktop, I can see the three services are up and running. I have my shipping API, my orders API, and my products API. So let's start with the main flow of creating an order. Here's the JSON request I'm going to send from Postman to my application and it's available on localhost 5001 slash orders. So I have my customer name, the shipping address and an array of items that I want to purchase as part of this order. So let's send this request and I'm going to land on the breakpoint in the orders post endpoint. And this is first going to kick off the validation of the individual order items. So I'm going to hit continue and you'll notice that this is taking a couple of seconds, but we're not really sure why. Then after we reach our next breakpoint, you can see we have five validated items. So all of them pass validation. We're going to proceed to save the order and publish the event. And you can see both of these operations complete pretty quickly. And finally, we get the 201 created response in Postman, which contains the order ID. But in order to figure out why our request is slow, we're going to check out Sentry, and it's not because I set a couple of breakpoints. Just to be sure, I'm going to create a another order with the same request body and you can see that even in this case the request is taking about five seconds to complete so something definitely doesn't add up so let's head over to the sentry dashboard and the first thing i want to highlight is the issues section where the sentry sdk is going to detect any unhandled exceptions inside of our application and list them inside of this view and here you can get so many details about the specific error for example you can see how often it occurs what is the url that was called inside our application that triggered this specific error if you keep scrolling down you can see a trail of breadcrumbs that can be useful to figuring out what caused the actual exception if i expand this we can get even more information where we can see the database queries that were executed as part of this transaction before the exception was thrown and you can really use this to pinpoint why the actual problem occurred. Now it even links this to any distributed traces that you have configured. We're going to talk more about this in a moment and then you can find some more valuable debugging info inside of the context section. So I just wanted to briefly highlight this. It's not what I'm going to focus on. What I actually want to show you is the trace explorer. So this is what it looks like and this is where we are going to load our open telemetry traces and be able to observe them. Right from the dashboard you can see a couple of span samples which you can start observing to figure out what the problem is. Then there's also a couple of sample traces or you can aggregate this data based on the values that you choose here. So let's say I want to aggregate this based on the HTTP request method. I can choose this and then I can see information that's grouped based on the get post or put HTTP methods or any other ones that I'm using. Now let's actually revert this and I want to go back to span samples. Another thing you can do from the trace explorer is filter the application traces. And let's say I want to look for traces where the request method is post. And this is going to help me easily find the post orders trace. So let's go inside and see if we can figure out why our request is taking so long. And right from the start, you can see the problem. We have one request landing on the post orders endpoint, and then we have multiple requests reaching out to the products API to get the product information. And this is a typical N plus one problem, and it's really not uncommon. I've seen it many times in production systems, and the solution for this is pretty straightforward. You can just group all of these calls into one request to the products API. I'm going to show you how to do this in just a moment. Now, going through the remaining parts of our distributed trace, you can see the information below that's related to persisting the order into the database. Here is our insert statement. And then we have publishing of the integration event and consuming that inside of the downstream services. So let's see if we can figure out how to solve this current problem. I'll go back to the endpoint for creating an order. And the problem is right here. We're fetching the information for a single product. So the solution is having a batched API that allows you to get the info for multiple products in a single request. So what I'm going to do here is take my order items and use them to extract the product IDs. So let's say order items select and for each of the order items we're going to look for the product ID and then I'm going to say to array. And then I can use my product service to obtain the information for all of the products 
by calling the get products by IDs async method. So let's pass it the product IDs. And this gives me back a list of product DTOs. So now I can replace all of this with just product DTOs. Let's call the find method. And let's say that the predicate is that the product ID is equal to the item request product ID. So with just this simple change in place, let's go ahead and start the application again. Let's go ahead and validate this by sending another post request. And you can see that it completes in around 280 milliseconds. So it's certainly much faster, but we're also going to validate this inside of our distributed trace. Now, another thing that happens behind the scenes is that we run into an exception during the product reservation flow. And I'm going to show you how we can use Sentry to figure out where the actual problem is. So let's go back to the Sentry dashboard. And if you take a look, we are currently sorting our spans based on the timestamp. And what I can do is instead sort by the span duration. So let's sort by the span duration in ascending order. And you can see that our post order span flows up to the top. So let's take a look at what we have inside. And now you can see that the complete API request completes in 279 milliseconds. And what we did here is simply send one batch request to the products API to retrieve the products information. So this is how you can use distributed tracing with Sentry to first figure out where the problematic part is inside of your system and then find a way how to solve this and lastly validate that the solution is working as expected. So now that we have this fixed, let's go back to the issues and let's take a look at this exception here, this system not implemented exception. It has a message that the product reservation logic is not implemented yet. And if I go down to the distributed traces, you can see that this is related to this trace here, which invokes the reserve stock endpoint. So let's see if we can expand this to understand why this is showing up. And this starts telling a different story. So first we have the shipment record scheduled event being published from our background job. And as we are processing this event, we are sending an API request to the reserve stock endpoint on the order service. Now this is running into an exception. So it may lead you to the conclusion that the problem is actually in the order service. So we should examine that in more detail to figure out how to solve this. But if we continue examining our distributed trace, you can see that we actually run into a problem when sending a downstream request to the product service. And here is the actual error which is our system not implemented exception. I know it's a bit of a silly example, but you can easily imagine how the problem here could be a database that's down. So the product service isn't able to respond to the API request. And this leads to a cascade of API errors that are propagated back to the original API call. So with distributed tracing, we have more information about the actual source of the API error. So now all we have to do is go back to our code and implement the actual reservation logic. And I'm going to take this opportunity to invite you to check out the link that's going to be in the pinned comment right below. If you go ahead and click this link, you're going to get free access to Sentry to explore all of the features that we demonstrated as part of this video. You can also grab the source code to actually implement the products reservation logic. And what I'm going to do is simply return a results OK response so that my endpoint doesn't crash. And then let's restart the application. And if I go back to the Sentry dashboard and search for reserve, let's see if we can find a trace that covers the logic that we just fixed. And you can see the trace here. We are again sending the shipment record scheduled event. And this time when we send an HTTP request to reserve the stock, it succeeds after the request completes in the products API. So we validated that our fix is now working, even though it's mocked. And you can also get some interesting information about the actual traces in the sidebar. I'm going to temporarily omit my face so that you can actually see the details here. And for example, one thing that stands out is that this particular span is significantly faster, up to 100% faster than the average length for this operation, which is around six seconds. You can also see the standard information for a span, which you can also expand from your code if you want to attach additional pieces of information. And finally, let's do a very quick recap of what we covered in this video. I demonstrated how you can use the Sentry Trace Explorer to observe your application's distributed traces, which we exported as open telemetry traces from our .NET application. And to be able to export this telemetry data into Sentry, we had to install two NuGet packages, Sentry ASP.NET Core and Sentry OpenTelemetry. We configured to use Sentry on our web host builder, where the key piece of configuration we needed to provide is the Sentry data source name, which we obtained from the Sentry dashboard. And then we've configured our sampling rate to determine 
determine how much tracing information to capture. Then we have to call use open telemetry and finally add sentry when we are configuring the tracing builder provider with our other open telemetry instrumentations. If you enjoyed this video about using sentry with .NET, go ahead and smash the like button. And after you've done that, go ahead and click the link that's going to be in the pinned comment right below to get free access to sentry for three months. Thanks a lot for watching this video and until next time, stay awesome.